We're continuing our study on the flesh. This will be our second session together on that topic. In our first session, we saw that each of us was born with a nature that opposes the things of God. We inherited it from Adam. Thankfully, through the Lord Jesus Christ, the damage that Adam brought through sin, sin intruded humanity, brought death into the world. Death is passed down from generation to generation. We're born separated from God. Thankfully, the last Adam, according to Romans 5, repaired that damage. And we're able to be reconciled to God, be forgiven, have a standing of righteousness in Christ. In session two, I want to think with you about how the flesh behaves. I introduced you to the three archetypes of the flesh in the Old Testament in the first session. We have King Saul, a very carnal king that ruled over Israel for 40 years, the first king of Israel. We have the Ishmaelites. Ishmael was a false son of, of Abraham, a son of the flesh, not the son of promise. And then we have the Amalekites. Amalek was the grandson of Esau. Esau was a carnal man. He lived for the moment. Uh, he didn't think about his future or live for uh, what would please the Lord. He was driven by his appetite. And as I mentioned in the last session, he sold his birthright for a bowl of soup when he was hungry to his brother Jacob. We're going to be in 1 Samuel 15, and I've chosen this chapter to think with you about how the flesh behaves. Saul is a picture of the flesh, which is in this chapter, and then also the Amalekites. So we have two symbols of the flesh in one chapter, and that in itself provides some good uh, practical teaching in the narrative. You might recall that Israel wanted a king. It offended Samuel. It hurt the heart of God. But God granted the request. It was a damaging answer to the request. The prophet Hosea tells us that God gave Israel Saul in his anger. Whenever God gives us something in his anger, that's not going to be a good thing. God is going to teach us something through that. And that's exactly what he did with the nation of Israel. After 40 years of a, under the rule of a selfish, self-centered, narcissist, kind of king, David looked fantastic. David, a true shepherd, had a heart for the people, had a heart for God, and he wasn't a perfect man, but he was a man zealous for God and ruled Israel in that fear and in that uh, commitment. So in 1 Samuel 15, this is really the peak of Saul's kingdom. In chapter 13, he disobeyed Samuel and offered a sacrifice before he's supposed to. It's quite likely that he intruded on the priesthood, and that was an offense that God did not take lightly. And in fact, he was told that he would not have a lasting dynasty. In this chapter, we're going to find out that Saul further disobeys the Lord, and it's going to cost him the kingdom. But this is really the pinnacle of Saul's kingdom. He has been able to vanquish the surrounding enemies. For the first time since Israel entered Cana, they have a large army. They've secured their borders, and that's where we're picking up the story. Samuel also said to Saul, the Lord sent me to anoint you king over his people, over Israel. Now, therefore, heed the voice of the words of the Lord. Thus says the Lord of hosts, I will punish Amalek for what he did to Israel, how he ambushed him on the way when he came out from Egypt. Now go attack Amalek, utterly destroy all that they have, and do not spare them. But kill both man, woman, infant, nursing child, ox, sheep, camel, and donkey. So we'll pause the reading there. We read in Exodus 17 about the battle with the Amalekites. And we learn in Deuteronomy 25, 17 through 19, that the Amalekites actually picked a fight with Israel. 
You might remember that God had delivered the Israelites from Egypt by the blood of the Lamb. Egypt is a symbol of the world, so he delivered them from Egypt. He delivered them from bondage, from slavery, brought them out of Egypt into the wilderness so he could have them to himself and have a special communion with them. It's the same with us. God, through the cross, brings us out of the bondage of sin, and he carves us out of the world. We're the ecclesia, the church, a people unto himself. On the way to Sinai, where God is going to introduce himself to his people and give his law to his people, these nomadic people called the Amalekites were coming north. They were uh, Bedouin people. They would be in the south of the Sinai Peninsula uh, during the winter months. And then as the summer approached and things were getting warm, they would go up into the northern part of the Sinai, which it was cooler and they could graze their, their flocks and herds. Well, as they're coming north, they meet about 2 million people they feel are trespassing in their land. And Moses tells us in Deuteronomy 25 that what they did was not a frontal assault, but they snuck around and they attacked Israel from behind. And they got the stragglers, the people that were weary and tired. And that was an offense against the Lord. Of course, in chapter 17, we see Moses up on the mount with the rod of God representing the authority of God, the intercession of Christ, so to speak. And we see Joshua, who represents Jehovah's salvation, the same name as Jesus, down below with the sword fighting the Malachites. And he slays the Amalekites. And although there were other men fighting, it says that Joshua slayed the Malachites. And so you have this beautiful picture of the Lord Jesus Christ, his intercession in heaven, and his power among his people in Exodus 17. In the church age, we have Christ in heaven as our great high priest, our intercessor, and he isn't fighting among his people. He's uh, within his people fighting the Malachites, which is a symbol of the flesh. It's an ongoing battle. Well, for the first time in about 400 years, Israel's in a position to even the score. God had not forgotten the offense after centuries, and he wants these Amalekites to be attacked. Uh, Moses said that the Amalekites should be attacked, uh, they should be wiped out, and now is the first opportunity that Israel has a strong enough army to do so. And God says, don't spare them utterly destroy them. As we go through the text, I want to pull out certain behaviors of the Malachites and align that with the behaviors of the flesh. Again, the Malachites are type of the flesh, and in this narrative, they, they quite accurately show the behavior of our own flesh nature. Sometimes we speak of a sin nature, it's terminology It's not actually in scripture, but we have a flesh nature that is prone to sin. And the Malachites demonstrate what that looks like. Notice in verse 3 that there was to be no mercy. Men, women, children, nursing children, babies, animals of the Malachites were all to be completely destroyed. And from an emotional standpoint, this is hard for us to understand. What did a little baby ever do to deserve death? Or children do to deserve death? Or what did the animals do to deserve death? And yet God is commanding King Saul to wipe them out completely. And from a emotional standpoint, that's hard for us to understand. Why would God command that? If you see the bigger picture and what God is trying to show us about the flesh in this chapter, then it makes perfect sense. For example, in Romans chapter 6 and verse 11, Paul says, Likewise, you also reckon yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God in our Lord Jesus Christ. And then in Romans 13, 14, he says, put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its loss. How much provision is the flesh supposed to have in the believer's life? 
absolutely none. It's to be put to death. Its impulses are to be mortified. Uh, any thought that doesn't uh, honor the Lord should be quickly mortified, taken captive, pulled out of our minds so we can go on thinking as the Lord does. And so if we understand that there's to be no provision for the flesh, there's to be full mortification, then it makes sense why the Amalekites were to be utterly destroyed. And this brings us to our first of nine points as we consider behavior of the flesh. The flesh always wants more. It's never satisfied. Solomon said the eye is not satisfied with seeing and the ear is not full of hearing. If we give in to our flesh on Monday, it just wants more on Tuesday. And so it always wants more. And that's why the Lord is saying utter decimation, utterly destroy the Malachites, make no provision to keep them alive. And the flesh is to have no provision. So the first point is the flesh always wants more. And the only solution is to give it no provision. Well, Saul responds and he gathers the people together. It's quite an army, 200,000 foot soldiers and 10,000 from the, the tribe of Judah in the south. And so he moves south towards the Amalekites and says in verse 5, he came to the city of Amalek and lay in wait in the valley. Then Saul said to the Kenites, go depart, get down from among the Amalekites, lest I destroy you with them. For you showed kindness to all the children of Israel when they came up from Egypt. So the Canaanites departed from among the Amalekites. And Saul attacked the Amalekites from Havilah all the way to Shur, which is east of Egypt. He also took Agag, king of the Amalekites, alive and utterly destroyed all the people with the edge of the sword. But Saul and the people spared Agag and the best of the sheep and the oxen, the fatling, the lambs, and all that was good and were unwilling to utterly destroy them. But everything despised and worthless they utterly destroyed. We'll pause our reading there. So Saul takes this large army south, over 200,000 soldiers. He comes to the valley in which the Amalekites are inhabited, but he also finds the Canaanites there. And because the Canaanites had been favorable to the Israelites as they were making their way into Cana, they were to be spared. Saul did not want to slaughter them with the Malachites. So they're given a warning, they heed it, and they leave. And now they just have the Malachites there and Saul attacks. And he, he destroys many of the people, but he keeps the king alive and he keeps the best of the livestock alive. And this brings us to the second point about the flesh. The flesh will always justify incomplete obedience. The flesh does not value things the way God does. God said, destroy it all. He didn't see any value in it at all. But man puts a premium on things that God doesn't. And when we weigh things out differently than God does, we don't accept his standard of things, his standard of right and wrong, his standard of what is good and bad what is wise and foolish, then we're going to enter into error and to sin. So Saul justifies incomplete obedience. He was told to kill everyone and kill the livestock. And so the people, they look on the livestock and they say, wow, what a waste. These sheep, they're good looking sheep. Um, this bull, oh, such a good looking bull. What a waste. Well, at least we could take it back and, and offer it for sacrifice. Uh, there's value in this. Um, maybe they were thinking about crossbreeding some of their stock. Certainly they were probably thinking about sacrifices to the Lord. Saul mentions that later. But the fact is they were disobedient. Man sees value in what God does not. Uh, what God values is often despised by man. Uh, for example, in the spiritual realm, things that are broken have more value to God than things are unbroken. 
For example, a broken and contrite heart, that's a very special thing to the Lord. But in the physical realm, if someone throws a baseball through your front window and smashes it, you pick up the pieces and you throw it away. It has no value. But broken things, humble things, contrite things in the presence of God have great value. Well, the Lord has a message for Samuel. He says, it greatly, I greatly regret that I have set up Saul as king, for he has turned back from following me and has not performed my commandments. And it grieved Samuel, and he cried out to the Lord all night. This is the bright spot in the chapter. Here we have the spiritual man, the man who thinks as God thinks. And he wants Israel to have a good shepherd. It's not Saul. God has somebody else in mind. And we find him grieving and praying and crying out to God all night long. While others slept and rested, the spiritual man wrestles with the Lord in prayer. He was a man of faith and he petitions and he's, he wants the best for Israel. He cries out to the Lord. In the morning, he gets up. It says, so when Samuel rose early in the morning to meet Saul, it was told Samuel, saying, Saul went to Carmel, and indeed, he set up a monument for himself. And he has gone on around, passed by, and gone down to Gilgal. Now, this is interesting. Now, Carmel is not Mount Carmel. There was a city... Uh, not even a city, a village in the south. And Saul stopped at this village on the way from the Malachites to Gilgal and erected a monument of his great achievement, his great victory in battle. And so he is he's uh, boasting in, in what he accomplished. But as we can see in the next few verses, the flesh boasts in itself against the truth. Because it says in verse 13, Then Samuel went to Saul, and Saul said to him, Blessed are you of the Lord. I have performed the commandment of the Lord. I think Samuel's visit to Gilgal shocked Saul. He wasn't expecting the premier prophet of Israel to be at Gilgal. And so he gives this really fine greeting to Samuel. And he says, And I have obeyed the Lord. And about that time, Samuel hears, Meh, in the background, the bleeding of sheep and the lowing of oxen, it says in verse 14. You say you've completely obeyed the Lord? What do I hear in the background? You were supposed to completely destroy the people and all the livestock, and you have not done it. Again, the third point is the flesh boasts itself against the truth. The flesh loves to boast in itself, but it's not even in the truth. It exaggerates. How many times have you heard somebody say, well, I caught this big a fish, and, and it kind of keeps growing. Um, we like to exaggerate our accomplishments. The flesh just relishes in it. And the spiritual man boasts in the Lord. And what the Lord has done. Uh, the best thing we can do is when we do have a victory and somebody compliments or thanks us is just praise the Lord, thank the Lord. Uh, deflect that praise right up to the Lord. Whereas Corey Timboom said uh, she would gather up each compliment throughout the day and carefully arrange a bouquet of praise and offer that to the Lord at the end of each day. The flesh boats against the truth. It exalts itself against the truth. And Saul said, this is verse 15, they have brought them from the Amalekites. Who's they? That's the people. Notice the pronouns here. They have brought them from the Amalekites, for the people spared the best of the sheep and the oxen, to sacrifice to the Lord your God, and the rest we have utterly destroyed. So in the matters of disobedience, Saul blame shifts. He said the people did it. The people spared the best livestock. They brought them from the Malachites. But he says, but we, including himself, we utterly destroyed the rest. 
And this is the fourth point. The flesh blame shifts. The flesh does not like to take responsibility for failures and sin. It wants to shift that on someone else. And you can certainly see that in our political system today. No one wants to take responsibility uh, for making mistakes, errors in judgment and sin. Uh, it's typically someone else's to blame. The flesh blame shifts. Then Samuel said to Saul, be quiet. Now that's very polite. He's basically saying, shut up. I have something to tell you from the Lord. He says, be quiet. I will tell you what the Lord said to me last night. And the king says, speak on. So Samuel said, when you were little in your own eyes, were you not head of the tribes of Israel? And did not the Lord anoint you king over Israel? Now the Lord sent you on a mission and said, Go and utterly destroy the sinners, the Amalekites, and fight against them until they are consumed. Why then did you not obey the voice of the Lord? Why did you swoop down on the spoil and do evil in the sight of the Lord? And Saul said to Samuel, but I have obeyed the voice of the Lord and gone on the mission on which the Lord sent me and brought back Agag, king of the Amalek. I have utterly destroyed the Malachites. The next thing that we see here of the flesh is that when the flesh is confronted, not only does it blame shift and try to make others responsible for one's errors, the flesh justifies and defends itself. This is a natural thing. The flesh, when confronted, will try to justify itself and it will defend itself vehemently, try to escape the consequences. It should be pointed out that all sin has consequences. When the Lord chastens us, He's often merciful in the way that he tempers his judgment. He wants to teach us, for the believer that is. He wants to teach us. Uh, Hebrews chapter 12 tells us that um, God loves those he chastens. It's a proof that, that we're a child of God. In Saul's case, the consequences would be incredible. In chapter 13, no lasting dynasty. In chapter 15, he's going to lose the kingdom. God's going to take it away from him and give it to David. But the repercussions of Saul's sin, it's going to go on for centuries. First of all, in the first chapter of 2 Samuel, who is it that claims to have killed King Saul? An Amalekite. Now, I don't think the Amalekite actually killed Saul, but that's what the Amalekites do. They exalt themselves against the truth. This Amalekite came on the battlefield shortly after Saul and his sons died, and he was trying to, to gather up the spoil off the dead before the Philistines came in. And he found King Saul. He takes the crown, some other uh, royal trinkets that, that Saul had on him, and he brings it to David. Of course, David didn't look kindly on that, and it cost the Malachite his life. But it was an Amalekite that claimed to have killed King Saul. Well, if Saul would have wiped out the Amalekites, there would never have been an Amalekite there to claim that he killed Saul. And then centuries later, in the book of Esther, Haman, the one who comes up with this scheme to wipe out the Jews and gets the king to sign that decree was a descendant of Agag. And again, if Agag and all of his descendants had been wiped out, there never would have been a Haman in the book of Esther to try to annihilate the Jewish people throughout the Persian Empire. And so often God uses the area that we are disobedient in to chasten us. We choose our sin, God chooses the consequences of our sin, and often the consequences of our sin uh, is going to further teach us about the horror of, of the sin in the first place, and that we should avoid doing it. 
Verse 21, but the people took of the plunder, the sheep, the oxen, the best of the things which should have been utterly destroyed to sacrifice to the Lord your God in Gilgal. Notice he says, Lord your God, Samuel's God. He doesn't speak of Jehovah as his God. So Samuel said, has the Lord a great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to heed than the fat of the rams. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has also rejected you from being king. Samuel says, obedience is better than sacrifice. Actually, this is one of seven things throughout the Bible that are better than the sacrifice. Obedience. Another one is in Psalm 51, 17, the broken heart is better than sacrifice. And so there was no amount of disobedience that could justify what Saul had done. God gave him a very specific command and Saul had disobeyed that command. He may apply to human reasoning, and there's other factors, which we'll see in a minute, that led to his disobedience. But he has nothing that he can leverage himself with the Lord. He is guilty, and it's going to take him a while to come to that conclusion. Rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. Stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. What is Christendom doing today? So much of... Uh, the professing church is not following scripture. They're following a humanized version of what they think Christianity should be instead of following the decrees that are in scripture about church life and church truth pertaining to the uh, person and character of Christ and his work on the cross. A lot of false teaching today and rebellion is as a sin of witchcraft. Stubbornness is an iniquity and idolatry. Then Saul said to Samuel, I have sinned, for I have transgressed the commandment of the Lord and your words, because I feared the people and obeyed their voice. Now, if the king would have started out this way, I have sinned, this chapter may have ended differently. But that's not what happened. And even when he says it, he doesn't really mean it. That comes out clearly in the rest of the text of this chapter. He says, I sinned because I feared the people and obeyed their voice. And this is the sixth point concerning the behavior of the flesh out of this chapter. The flesh fears man more than God. The flesh fears the consequences of man more than the consequences of God, which means that there is a deficient view of God in, a, in an overzealous fear of man. The Lord says that we're not to fear anyone but the Lord, the one who can destroy the soul. That means that we're not even to fear Satan. We're told to resist him, not to fear him. Fear the one who's in control of all things. This reverential respect, this awe of God. The flesh doesn't do that. The flesh fears man, the temporal consequences, the immediate consequences of flesh and blood more than the eternal consequences of an all-knowing, all-powerful, all-seeing, sovereign God. And so, no wonder Saul says to Samuel, your God, Jehovah, your God. He doesn't ever say uh, that Jehovah is his God. And he says, now, therefore, please pardon my sin and return with me that I may worship the Lord. But Samuel said to Saul, I will not return with you, for you have rejected the word of the Lord. And the Lord has rejected you from being king over Israel. And as Samuel returned around to go away, Saul seized the edge of his robe and tore it. So Samuel said to him, the Lord has torn the kingdom of Israel from you today and has given it to a neighbor of yours who is better than you. 
And also the strength of Israel will not lie or relent, for he is not a man that he should relent. So Saul says, I've sinned. Please pardon me, but come and worship with me. In other words, privately, he was telling Samuel, okay, I've done wrong. I've sinned, but please pardon and come worship with me. He wanted the premier prophet of Israel to be seen with him before the people. He wants to save face. It's, it's really shallow remorse. He's more worried about what the people think here than what God thinks. This comes out very clearly in verse 30. Then he said, I have sinned, yet honor me now. Please, before the elders of my people and before Israel, return with me that I may worship the Lord your God. Again, he doesn't care getting right with the Lord. He doesn't care about what has happened. He just wants to be in, in good standing with the people, that they have a, a positive outlook upon their king. He's more concerned about his reputation than his sin. And Samuel turns back with him because he is the king of Israel, but Samuel doesn't worship with Saul. Saul's not in fellowship with God. How could Samuel partake in worship with someone who's not in fellowship with the Lord? And that's another good reminder for us to remember in the church age. Uh, we cannot worship with someone who's not in fellowship with the Lord. Our relationship with each other goes up before it goes down. If I'm not in fellowship with the Lord, there's no way that I can have fellowship with this brother. He has to be in fellowship with the Lord. I have to be in fellowship with the Lord. Then we get to share the Lord's fellowship. And Acts 2.42, there's actually a definite article before fellowship. It's the fellowship. It's his fellowship. It's the only thing that we can share. If it's not of Christ, then we can't share that. It's only what is in the Lord that we can share and enjoy together and that communion of the Spirit uh, with the Lord. So the seventh point is the flesh is more concerned about the honor of the people than the honor of God. The point before was the flesh fears man more than God. The seventh point is the flesh desires the honor of men more than the honor of God. So Samuel turned back after Saul, and Saul worshiped the Lord. Then Samuel said, Bring Agag, king of the Malachites, here to me. So Agag came to him cautiously, and Agag said, Surely the bitterness of death is past. Well, they had brought Agag probably 70 to 100 miles to Gilgal. If they were going to kill him, they could have killed him any time before then. So he's thinking, I'm, I'm going to be okay. So Samuel, the spiritual man, there's one more matter that he needs to deal with in this situation. Samuel says to Agag, as your sword has made women childless, so shall your mother be childless among women. And Samuel hacked Agag in pieces before the Lord in Gilgal. Then Samuel went to Ramah, and Saul went up to his house at Gibeah of Saul. And Samuel went no more to see Saul until the day of his death. Nevertheless, Samuel mourned for Saul, and the Lord regretted that he had made Saul king over Israel. Of course, the Lord already knew what would happen, but as it plays out in time, it still grieves the Lord that his people would have to suffer under a carnal king like Saul. But it was to punish them for wanting a king like the nations instead of having the Lord rule over them solely. The eighth point, notice that Samuel says, as your sword has made women childless, so shall your mother be childless. Well, Agag was a murderer. He had killed people, murdered people. The behavior of the Malachites back in the days when the children of Israel came out of Egypt hadn't changed. In 400 years, they were still murdering. And this is the eighth point. The behavior of the flesh doesn't change. It doesn't get better. It's impossible for the, the flesh to improve upon itself. In fact, 
The flesh only knows two things, gratification and mortification. And this is what Samuel shows us. He pulls out the sword. Samuel's in his 70s here, but he's a spiritual man, and he has the power of God on his side. And he hacks Agag into pieces. That would take a lot of force in order to do that with a sword. But Samuel, the spiritual man, slays King Agag of the Malachites. And that's the final point. The flesh only understands two things, gratification and mortification. And Samuel shows us that the spiritual man must mortify the flesh. That is why Saul could not kill Agag. The flesh will never mortify the flesh. King Saul is a picture of the flesh. Agag is a picture of the flesh. Saul just can't do it. And beloved, our flesh, we can't do it either. The flesh will never improve itself. We're just like the Malachites. We're going to behave in the flesh just like our forefathers did in the flesh. The flesh nature hasn't changed. It's only the Spirit of God coming in, the spiritual man, that mortifies the flesh impulses that then we get the victory. And that's what's shown to us in this text. Really a lovely narrative to show the nastiness of the behavior of the flesh. Let me go through these nine points just very quickly. Again, the flesh is to not to have any provision, meaning it always wants more. It's never satisfied. That's the first point. Secondly, the flesh will justify incomplete obedience. Why? Because it measures things differently than what God does. It puts a value on things that God doesn't. And thirdly, the flesh boasts itself against the truth. It exaggerates to honor itself. Fourthly, the flesh blame shifts. It doesn't want to take responsibility for its own failings. Fifth, when confronted, the flesh will justify and defend itself. Number six, the flesh fears man more than God. Number seven, the flesh loves the honor of men more than the honor of God. It desires the honor of men. Number eight, the flesh cannot change itself. It can't improve itself. The nature is the same all the way through. It's rotten to the core. Lastly, the uh, flesh only understands two things, gratification and mortification. And Samuel shows us the only solution in getting the, the flesh out of the way is total mortification. The spiritual man takes the sword. It's a great picture of the word of God. Spirit, po spiritual power, applying the word of God, mortifies the flesh, brings it into submission. Saul could not kill Agag because he's also a symbol of the flesh. The flesh will never mortify itself. Only the spirit of God and the word of God are the tools in which mortification can happen. Father, we thank you for this narrative. It's so insightful into the nastiness that's within us. We're thankful that in Christ we have your spirit and your word. We have the intercession of our great high priest in heaven who tells us to come boldly before the throne of grace and receive mercy in time of need. Uh, we have everything we need in order to not behave as we've just seen in this chapter. So I pray, Father, we would be spiritual men and women following the example of Samuel and giving the flesh no quarter, no mercy, utter mortification that you might be honored and glorified in all that we do. We ask this in the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen.